The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free, it was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid the child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth, they pretend to guard the health of the people and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back Confuses and conceals the fact That the wolf is at the door There's an unseen hand that pulls Well, good morning, America. It is April 30th, and today we have a another wonderful opportunity to learn the truth and connect some dots. And we have on our call this morning two ladies who are very, very deeply involved in the animal rights movement and animal husbandry. And uh, our guest today for this radio program is uh, Mindy Patterson. Uh, Mindy is a, a friend of some years now. I met her at the uh, Republican Convention in uh, Cleveland years ago. And uh, Mindy is a... Uh, she is the president and co-founder of the Cavalry Group. Uh, it's a national leader in advocating for and defending the constitutional and private property rights of law-abiding animal owners and animal-related businesses. She is uh, really the person who is, I guess, the, the, really the ultimate expert in the country on dealing with all the radical uh, animal rights groups that are around, around the country. Uh, we also are going to be joined today by Karen Yost. Uh, Karen is a, f a fellow Montanan, and uh, uh, Karen has been uh, Miss Montana a few years ago. She was uh, uh, very actively involved in agriculture. She and her hus husband own a, uh, uh, a business called Nutrilix, and uh, they do uh, 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 nutrition um, um, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to look for the right right term for this, but uh, mineral licks for uh, livestock. And, and uh, uh, she also has been very involved with the American uh, the American Farm Association, Montana Agri Women, and American Agri Women. And uh, she's really involved a lot with uh, the advocacy groups around Montana on property rights. And this is going to be a subject for today. I put my uh, on my announcement that went out. I intentionally found a uh, a thing that the uh, animal rights groups are putting out. They show these uh, these poor sheep laying there while uh, people are manhandling them. Well, the fact is, is they're shearing these sheep, and uh, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. As a matter of fact, it's good for the sheep. But if you didn't know better, you would think that they were being slaughtered there on the floor. That's exactly how these animal rights groups work. They take a picture and they blow it totally out of context. And then they go in and uh, talk about how uh, humans are abusing all these animals. And this has gone from 
circus animals to uh, farm animals, everything you can think of. This is going to be a really interesting show today. Mindy's been on our radio program before. Uh, Karen's new to this radio program, but uh, we're going to have fun today, and we're going to expose the truth behind the animal rights movement. So uh, with that, ladies, welcome to the radio program. Uh, Mindy, first, uh, if, you, if you would like to add anything about the work that you're doing with Cavalry group, please uh, feel free to do that right now. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, excellent. Wonderful. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. It's always so great to be on your show. Um, you know, with, with all the legislative sessions, um, well, a lot of them are winding down right now, but uh, we have been fighting a lot of the legislation at the local state and federal levels uh, that the Humane Society of the United States has been putting forth. And it's truly like playing whack-a-mole. All these bills get introduced on a Thursday. Uh, then we scramble to try and show up to the hearing on a Monday or Tuesday. And what we battle against on a daily basis is, as you've already described very well, the deceptive campaigns and this, this, the deceptive ideology that the Humane Society of the United States and a lot of these animal rights groups put forth, like there's a huge crisis that they're working to solve in animal uh, treatment by passing these bills. And the frustration that we have felt in doing this over the last 10 years now that we've been in, the Calvary Group has been in existence, we show up to the microphone to uh, defend animal agriculture and animal ownership and private property uh, by, you know, being there as a counter voice to explain to these legislators the truth about what they're hearing in these emotional, in this emotional testimony that these animal rights always put forth. And what I have learned is two things. One, it's really important that the lawmakers, as well as the public, but these lawmakers that are tasked with being really the judge, jury, and the executioner and passing these regulations that increase, you know, onerous regulations that inevitably put animal agriculture and a lot of the, the breeding operations for the pet industry and so forth out of business, um, are these legislators are being fooled and they fall for this emotional propaganda and they don't realize that the animal rights groups before them are putting forth basically a political agenda that is chipping away incrementally at our right to private property by altering and amending um, a lot of state constitutions and oftentimes there's language in these bills that masquerade as increased animal welfare, but really they always include legislation, legislative language that chips away at our right to due process, giving more power to bureaucrats, which just drives me crazy because that is not what the legislators should be tasked in doing. But they give not only more power to the bureaucrats, but also uh, a lot of these animal rights-based organizations and um Entities that are like animal control. They, you know, to, to believe that they're not animal rights driven, you're, you're fooling yourself. So all of these legislative pushes are just falling prey into the hands of the animal rights groups and these lawmakers are falling for it. There is a huge difference between animal rights and animal welfare and, you know, none of us condone animal abuse. But what I was going to say too is the second thing is we already have animal cruelty laws on the books in all 50 states. If we just enforce those laws, we don't need any of this other stuff. All of these things take away and chip away at our freedom to operate freely in businesses that, you know, business owners have had the freedom to operate all along under the Constitution. But these new regulations tighten the noose. And finally, I'll, I'll include in my uh, what I've been up to lately, in addition to fighting bad legislation, we finally went on offense and introduced a bill in several states this year in several legislatures called the Working Animal Protection Act. And Dan, as you know, your state of Montana was one of the states, uh, Representative Teresa Manzella carried the bill 
unfortunately it didn't make it out of the Senate, but um, she did a fantastic job in carrying the, the legislation for the state of Montana. It's currently still moving through the Missouri legislature and Texas as well. But basically all it says is that it, it, it basically says that local political subdivisions or uh, city councils and county councils cannot outright ban le legal businesses that are already regulated and have oversight. They can't ban them out of business. <laughs> so we have a constitution to do that, as you know. But at the same time, unfortunately, we're having to now pass laws to protect our constitutional rights to operate legal business businesses that are already legally operating. So that's that's what we've been busy doing. And, and actually, Karen Yost was. Um, who's also your other guest today, she testified in favor of uh, House Bill 379 in, in your state house in Montana in favor of the Working Animal Protection Act. So that's what we've been up to lately, um, in addition to, you know, protecting the rights of the individuals of our, of our members in, and their constitutional rights to, to private property. Things pop up and we try to be there with our uh, legal team as well. But the legislative issues are important because, in my opinion, they are ground zero in protecting um, animal agriculture, animal ownership, and private property going forward. Well, certainly so, Mindy, and I, I have to uh, I have to say that you know you and I have had these discussions many, many times, but it's all the same movement. It's all the same groups that are promoting the same things. And that's literally cradle to grave control of everything we do. And it's not intended to foster or promote good agriculture, good agribusiness. It's designed to get us off the land. It's designed to destroy our private property rights and put us in a position where uh, they can implement all of the policies of UN Agenda 21, which means that we'll be moved off the countryside. The countryside will become a nature preserve for uh, God knows what, but uh, agriculture as we know it, small farms and agribusiness as we know it, will be a thing of the past, and we will be literally living in a brave new world. And I, I have to, uh, I have to throw that in because that, that's what it always boils back to the same, same thing every time, right, Mindy? Absolutely, and I love the fact that you included that because it will never be good enough. Nothing will ever please these extremists, both environmental and animal rights, because it, if they have an agenda that is a complete abolition of animal ownership and private property. It, it, you know, these local city council and county council bans and, and state laws that have been pushed strictly by animal rights groups with their emotional propaganda... Uh, pushing this premise that anyone who raises, breeds, or works with animals is implementing cruelty just simply by, you know, uh, putting a saddle on a horse, simply by putting a dog on a leash, simply by raising cattle for food. Those things they consider, they deem cruelty. It doesn't matter how well you take care of them. And I love that you use the word husbandry because the fact is those involved with animals on a daily basis all practice time-tested animal husbandry to ensure the health of both safety of, of health and safety of both people and animals but these practices are being redefined as inhumane treatment of animals by these radical groups and that's the that's the thing that this legislative push is doing it's redefining what they consider to be humane and inhumane so we end up playing defense I don't like playing defense because nothing we ever say will be good enough or please these people who have an ideology to completely eliminate what it is we're trying to defend. So that's why we went on offense to, to alert these lawmakers that, you know, we shouldn't be banning legal businesses and doing away with the constitutional right of, of operating legally. Uh, our God-given rights that are protected by the Constitution. Um, I mean, this is this is what's at stake here. I mean, someday, as you said in your intro, people won't even be able to own a pet. But that's and 
sometimes people think we're kidding, and we're not kidding. It's, it's all incremental. They're working at this in an incremental fashion through the media, through our schools, through legislation and litigation. They're just chipping away. And their end goal is, is to end animal use in every capacity, from biomedical research to food, entertainment, sports, zoos, rodeos, 4-H, FFA, I mean, everything to the, to the steak on your plate. And people are not paying attention, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. Uh, you know, and, and it's always directed against Americans and against the United States. And I used this a few weeks ago. We had, uh, I have a friend in uh, San Diego's a, a forensic accountant that sent me this information, and I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to mention it again. Uh, they did, and this is from the World Health Organization, they did an actual uh, study of the most polluted cities in the world. And they they went to the uh, 500 most. They didn't pick just a handful. They went to the 500 most polluted cities in the world. Well, guess what? Not one of them is in the United States, and more than half are in the country of China, but yet communism and and uh, the, the communist state of the People's Republic of China is the darling of the UN, and uh, they can do no wrong, and and they get a free pass on everything. Yet they've got uh, 260 some of the 500 most polluted cities in the world are in China. Uh, so when people people have to realize this is actually an attack by the Marxists that run the United Nations, the Marxists who have been trying to destroy our constitutional republic for the last 110 or 120 years, are uh, have this in full gear right now, and they are really serious about shutting down the United States. And the yep. United States in animal husbandry is the number one country in science and research and information that makes animal abuse in the United States probably the lowest of anywhere in the world, yet they pick on us. Oh, yeah, and all that propaganda footage you people see on commercials to raise money for these animal rights groups, that's typically either something that's already illegal or something footage from another country. It's not even here in the United States. Do I have time for a very brief story to share here? I, I wasn't sure if you're coming up on a break or anything, but I wanted to share something briefly. That sure. in, in 1972, I was in the fourth grade, and I it was a rainy day at my little elementary school at Baldwin Stocker in Southern California, and because it was a rainy day, we watched movies at lunchtime instead of going out to the playground. And my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Schwinn, made sure that we watched a movie about pollution and how uh, corporations are exploiting our, our rivers and our land and needlessly killing animals for food and blah, blah, blah. And I was so upset by the visuals in this movie I ran home, I lived two blocks from the school, and I ran home, and my dad worked from home. I went straight to his office in tears, and my dad was a World War II veteran, and everything, he just oozed, you know, patriotism, and, you know, I just, I just adored my dad, but he stopped me in my tracks, and he said, Mindy, he said, we are living in a country that is so blessed to be prosperous. And because we are prosperous, our water is the cleanest it's ever been, our air is the cleanest it's ever been, our emissions are, from our vehicles are clean, we have, you know, an abundance of healthy food, affordable food, safe food. You stop this right now and realize that this is probably the most important lesson you're going to learn in your school, in all of your years of school. He said, prosperity and the American way of life and capitalism is the answer to solving all the problems that you were spoon-fed in that movie this afternoon. And that has stuck with me my entire life. And, you know, it's not just because I adored my dad, but it was because time and time again he has proven, his words have proven to be true. 
We are able to solve problems and innovate because we are a prosperous nation and because of capitalism. And capitalism is under attack like I've never seen. And it's subtle. And it's even in the propaganda from the animal rights movement. They vilify people for making a profit. They vilify people for making a living, for raising, breeding, and working with animals. That is at the, that is at the core of their, um, of their exploitation, of people who have worked with animals for generations. And I, I just think about that day in 1972 when I ran home to talk to my dad about this. And I, I just, it, it, it is so true. We have to start promoting and educating our youth and other generations too as to why capitalism is the answer and prosperity is uh, what makes us great and solves these dilemmas. We don't want to be a third world country, but that's what Nancy Pelosi and all these other politicians are creating in their own districts with, you know, by, by banishing prosperity and allowing uh, they're basically creating these third world country issues in their own backyard. It's, it's really awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, the truth is we are in a battle um, for the future of our nation because we are in a battle with Marxists and progressive socialists. Uh, I refer, refer to them as communists because that's ultimately what they are. But we have been losing this battle for the last 25 years in, in a big way. And we have really seen a difference when uh, Barack Obama was president because uh, in those eight years, I mean, we adopted so many socialist programs. Uh, it was bad during the Clinton years. It was actually bad during the Bush years. But uh, Obama turned it on hyperdrive. And that's why the deep state has such an absolute contempt and detests Donald Trump is because Donald Trump believes in uh, American uh, superiority. He, he believes in the American dream. He's lived the American dream. And he isn't owned by the political class. And the rest of them are. And they are 100% on board with this one world uh, Marxist socialist technocratic government that they see happening under UN Agenda 21. Uh, Karen, I, I'm sorry to have left you out of the conversation so long. I want to introduce you to our listeners. Uh, I have to tell you, you are uh, the sitting image of my uh, cousin Arlene Wepler, uh, who you probably know, uh, but uh, Arlene um, uh, and you look an awful lot alike. Um, gosh, I don't know if I do, but I appreciate you having me on your show, Dan. Um, um, I'm glad to be on here, and you haven't left me out at all. I just love the information that um, Mindy is sharing. We just are so in sync with the things that we talk about, and I come from a little bit different background than Mindy does. Um, I'm actually raised on a farm and ranch and um, have conservative values as well. And I don't know, um, while Mindy was talking about her experience, I thought we were talking kind of about just animal rights, but property rights and the sovereignty of the United States is a huge issue for me. So I might just share a similar uh, of memory that I have of school if we have time to do that. Um, I was probably in the eighth grade and I went to a small country school. Actually, I was raised in Park City and that's Montana, not Utah. Um, we used to have movie day once a day, uh, once a week. And we'd go down into our little basement which um, and the lady would turn on, this is how old I am, we'd have one of those reel-to-reel -reel things and play the movies. And one of the things I distinctly remember was watching a movie about Russia and how the children in Russia were indoctrinated by um, the, uh, the government, by everything they wrote, by the newspaper, and how things behind the Iron Curtain, freedom could not be told back there. And what I can't help thinking about is the indoctrination the parallel of the indoctrination of our school children today and how it's changing our whole generation of children to take away the respect for our Constitution. And I think about that often and it's like, wow, that's exactly what's happening here. 
Yeah, John, you're right. And of course, our education system, the uh, the people who want to control the world learned a long time ago. They learned it from Adolf Hitler. If you control the youth, uh, you can control the future. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. And Common Core and our education system today uh, doesn't even begin to look anything like it did when we were young. I'm, uh, I'm close to your age. We're, we're uh, very, very close in age. And uh, all I can say is that uh, ha had we undergone that kind of uh, that kind of an education system when we were younger, this country would not be the beautiful free country that it is today, and we are losing it at light speed. Yeah, it's really scary. Yeah, that's very true. So I appreciate well, uh, this opportunity to be here and visit with you about these things that are so important to our country. Well, they are. And uh, Karen, um, you, you've got a really interesting background. I'm a Montana boy myself. I was uh, born and raised uh, uh, in Belgrade or west of Belgrade. We had a small farm there. Um, and I, uh, I grew up in Montana in a very rural environment, very patriotic environment. And uh, I've, I've watched how things have changed over the last, uh, really in a big way, over the last 40 years. Uh, but especially the last 25, and uh, really what we've done is we've we've changed the focus uh, in our country from the protection of individual rights and property rights to collectivism, to uh, uh, groupthink, to you know creating rights that uh, protect the group rather than the individual. And if you don't have individual rights, you will not have group rights. It's just that simple. If you don't protect the rights of the minorities and everyone individually uh, and you create a democracy that's based strictly on numbers, you are not going to have freedom in this country. It's going to go the other way. That's true. Another thing that we have taught in schools for years is what's called values clarification. I'm sure you're aware of it, which basically mm -hmm. is much on that. It doesn't matter if there's truth or not. It matters how you feel about it, and then how you react is what's important. So it's interesting to me that when you uh, reach, a, try to reach a generation who's been raised with that system, that uh, science does not matter. Um, it doesn't matter how many facts you give to those people that have been raised like this. It just matters how it, what feels good to them and what they think they want to do about it. So that's a huge right. threat to our animal. Right. And that, that's at the heart of indoctrination, and that's really what it is. It's, it's using emotion to uh, change people's minds about things that common sense would tell them are not not right if they uh, if they go a particular direction, but yet emotion will push them in that direction, and that, that's taking away our rights as individuals. True. Well, I was also interested to see that you're from Pony now, which is one of my most favorite places in all of Montana. So I'm a little jealous because I live next to the railroad track. There you have it. So um, um, I just wanted to maybe tell you a little bit about my history, too. Um, I um, always believed as a Montanan that agriculture in Montana was the true agriculture. And it wasn't until I joined American Agri Women in 1996 that I actually realized that every state in the union has agriculture as its number one economy. I think there might be one of you that. And that all states uh, depend upon agriculture so completely. And yet, in, in that, there's less than 5% of legislators in any state and in our national government that not only do not have a farm or ranch background, but have had any kind of experience with agriculture. And so these are the people who are making our laws and uh, trying to legislate, or they are legislating, how we raise animals, how we farm crops, whether beef is actually detrimental to our environment. And it's from this ignorance of good intentions that brings all these bad implications to our country. And it's a very dangerous situation for us. Yes, it is. Um, absolutely. Um, well, and like I said earlier, if you see the picture on my announcement that went out, it's uh, uh, shearing sheep. Uh, 
uh, shearing sheep is a pretty painless thing for the sheep, and it gets rid of all the ticks and uh, cleans them up for the summer so they can grow more wool. It's a productive use of wool. Uh, it's a productive thing to do, and, and, and the, the sheep actually benefit by this because when they're sheared, they also get dipped, and that gets rid of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ticks and parasites that grow on sheep. If you look at that picture, you'd swear there, there was a bunch of people in there trying to kill these poor sheep. The same people that are promoting animal rights are the ones that are promoting wolf infection, where literally in one night you might see a hundred sheep killed by a pack of wolves and, and not even eaten, and yet they don't say a word about that, but they'll uh, attack somebody for doing something like productively uh, using animals like sheep for wool and other uses. That's well, I think too bad you can get a picture of the little kid in the wool sack stomping the wool. That would have been something they could have taken a picture of as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, uh, maybe I want to get you back in the conversation. We're heading into break, so if if you hear the music come on, uh, just hold your thought until the other side of the break. But um, I, I know for a fact that you've been battling all this legislation, as you said, all over the country. I want to hear if you're having some success as well as uh, seeing a lot of problems. Oh, we absolutely are. We are too. Oh, yeah. There's the music. I'll put it on pause. <laughs> okay, Mindy, I'm sorry. The music's on. We'll uh, break and then we'll pick it up on the other side of the break. Sounds good. Welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Apple. And uh, our guests today on the radio show are Mindy Patterson and Karen Yost. And uh, Mindy was uh, about to tell us some of the successes that she's had with dealing with the animal rights groups in the legislatures. And I, uh, I really want to hear anything positive that you can bring to this conversation, Mindy. Well, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with some of these. They call them pet sale bans. I call them rescue mandates. Uh, it's where the animal rights group, primarily the Humane Society of the United States, <clears throat> has been implementing this uh, legislation at the local and state level uh, in some states, uh, only a handful of states so far, where it basically mandates that pet stores uh, sell dogs and cats only sourced from unregulated sources such as rescues and shelters and basically banning the sale of puppies and kittens from licensed sources, regulated sources and USDA licensed breeders from across the country. So it basically is <clears throat> under the false premise that people who breed animals are evil and, you know, doing raising them in unscrupulous conditions and, you know, unscrupulous operators and uh, which is just nothing, nothing true about that whatsoever. <clears throat> and so we were successful in stopping a statewide ban, which was a bit of a heavy lift, but we managed to do it in the committee. Uh, this again was in Washington State in February, and it was uh, House Bill 1640 and Senate Bill 5209. Uh, we <clears throat> basically traveled to the state of Washington, gathered our members, uh, spent a day or two, assisting our members in testifying, writing their testimonies. When I say our members, I mean both people who breed animals for sale, not just directly to, them, to uh, people who want to buy a puppy or kitten, but also they, they sell them through pet stores. And also uh, of our members, it includes pet stores themselves. So these people were basically at the mercy of the legislature because when these things pass, it completely wipes out their business. Their business does not survive just selling dog dishes, you know, collars and pet food. These, these businesses exist because these pet stores love, you know, selling puppies and kittens to, I mean, there's a market for it. There's a demand. And they wouldn't have been successful. Many of them have been in, in business for 30, 40 years. So we held this hearing in, in Washington State before the uh, Labor and Commerce Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, basically we showed up with 17 testifiers 
uh, from veterinarians to pet store owners to breeders themselves that basically uh, provided fast science and indeed heartfelt testimony and that this is my business. Uh, you know, how can you possibly ban a legal business? You know, where in the Constitution, in our natural rights, as I said earlier, which the Constitution protects, does it give government the right to put people out of business? You know, that's really the question of the day, because that's, that's what we're really here to talk about today, in my opinion. You know, the animal rights movement is the vehicle that we, they're, they're cloaked in this emotional propaganda, this emotional agenda, so what they're really after is putting everybody out of business, uh, cattle ranchers, the pet producers, everybody. Uh, they're just looking to put everybody out of business, and that, that is their motive. Um, you know, and government, local, state, and federal, is basically disregarding the Constitution. These legislators are just completely forgetting the fact that you know, these people have a legal right to do what they've always had a legal right to do, and it's government's role to protect and preserve the rights of the individual, which is why we have a constitution. But here we are showing up to these committee hearings where you really truly feel like you're on the chopping block. And for me, testifying on behalf of our members, you know, it, it, it becomes a very impassioned testimony for me because I don't raise dogs. I don't own a pet store. It's about liberty for me. It's about the freedom to operate a business that you choose, you know, how to make a living. And yet, here we are in front of this committee hearing in, a, in the state capitol in Washington, you know, and they're, they're deciding once again, they're the judge, jury, and the executioner. But it was really great because at the end of the hearing, which uh, we had 17 people on our side testifying against this ban. It was an outright ban, by the way, and the animal rights groups had about six people show up. Uh, all they had was emotion. All they had was, I, I will just state it a fact, all they do is lie. All they do is lie. They come up with, they drum up all these false narratives about how these puppies are raised and how, you know, the conditions are terrible. You know, do those things exist out there? Sure, but not in the breeders that we're discussing here. The breeders that are selling uh, animals to pet stores and to consumers are required by law to be licensed. Uh, oftentimes, not only at the state level, but at the federal level, um, anyone who sells animals through a pet store are required to be USDA licensed. That means they're inspected on a regular basis uh, in unannounced inspections, and the regulations are pretty onerous. And I'm sorry, but to, to say that we are going to mandate that pet stores must source the animals for sale from unregulated sources because as we sit here today, there is no oversight of shelters and rescues. As we sit here today, shelters and rescues have become the gaming of the system as the nonprofits that are importing dogs and other animals from foreign countries to come into the U.S. to fill up these shelters and rescues that are being the source for, uh, you know, pet stores. And it's a joke because there's no oversight there. And these animals are bringing in disease. They're bringing in animals that have no behavioral background or, um, you know, they're, they're just, there's they're a big question mark. And so people, because they have a you know, well-intended, as Karen said, which was so well put, uh, you know, people may be well-intended, but oftentimes these intentions are the doom of an industry. And, you know, we have laws on the books and oversight of these, of these different breeders and, and industries for a reason, and that just completely goes away when these bans go into place. We've seen these bans, statewide bans pass in California and in Maryland, and in local municipalities all over the country to the tune of about 220 of them for in many, many states. And so, you know, again, these bans just crush these animal businesses, not just the pet stores, but the breeders as well, while they're vilified as being the bad guys. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, and so we were able to shut this ban down. I'm sure it will come back next year That's because that's what they do, the animal rights people have a lot of money to spend so they'll be back and we will show up to the microphone along with them once again 
to make sure that we show up with the facts and the science to defeat these bans. So we were successful in stopping this uh, legislation in Washington State. We were also successful in stopping a bill in Illinois, which was SB 154, which my summary of that bill was the criminalization of animal exhibits. Uh, it basically amended the criminal code, if you can believe that, um, provide in Illinois, providing that a person uh, is committing unlawful use of animal uh, exhibiting in a traveling animal act when he or she knowingly allows for the participation of an animal in an animal exhibit uh, and using transport to arrive at the location. So in other words, if you have, you know, animals, llamas, exotic cows, whatever it may be on their on the animal rights list uh, following in the definitions of this bill, and a lot of these animals are, are you know, things like kangaroos, zebras, animals you would see in a petting zoo, animals you would see at the state fair or county fair. They want to criminalize these petting zoos or animal exhibitors for basically transporting these animals to a county fair or the state fair. It would completely, essentially, equate a ban. It, this is insane, and this is what the animal rights industry does. But they create this image like, oh, it's a huge crisis, and these animals undergo this torture and transport, and they undergo, they, and really at the end of the day, they just simply believe that we are exploiting animals by having them there for people to um, touch and pet and view and learn about, and they don't want that. They want that all to go away. And you, you and I, we all know that you only care about animals when you, or anything for that matter, when you're able to touch it, feel it, learn about it, and we are going, that's what the fair is all about. The state fair isn't the state fair without animals. But the animal rights groups are successfully banning the exhibition of animals in these ex exhibiting situations, which is why we also have the Working Animal Protection Act, because we want to protect our fairs and the exhibiting of animals. This is the insanity that's going on, but they cloak themselves in this deceptive agenda to um, bring about a, a uh, win in their column to basically ban the use of any kind of, of animals and it's absolutely pure insanity but those are two uh, two wins that we've had this year um, we are very close to passing the Working Animal Protection Act in Missouri um, and we are already having conversations about reintroducing it in several states for the next legislature um, as far as other bills that we've killed, um, you know, we have been successful in stopping several carriage bans at the local level in the last six months. We, were, we successfully stopped the carriage ban in Chicago. We successfully stopped the carriage ban in Nashville, Tennessee. We are ever vigilant in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, there has been, there's been saber rattling that we have been helping our carriage members in Shreveport. Louisiana um, and, and other parts around the country, but actual bans we have stopped have been Nashville, Tennessee, and um, and Chicago, Illinois. So those are uh, we'll add that to the list. But it just never ends. It's it's just constant. But I'll be glad when the state legislative sessions wind down because it's been exhausting. There have been uh, a lot of bills that we unfortunately have have um, they have lost to as well. Um, unfortunately, that California, I mean, I don't even know if it's worth mentioning, <laughs> but, but they have a, a, a exhibiting ban uh, there that they're calling a circus ban in the state of California that unfortunately is marching along to the animal rights finish line. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that California lawmakers choose and do the right thing to support animal enterprise and, and don't um, pass the bill, but they seem to be uh, marching in the wrong direction. So, anyway. Well, uh, California is in general marching in the wrong direction, um, and, and they're marching at uh, 
A very quick pace because uh, California is moving very quickly into the status as a third world culture and they're doing it uh, knowing full well what they're doing. So uh, I, I want to get Karen back into the conversation. Uh, Karen, uh, Mindy was talking about education and that's an area that you seem to be very, very passionate about. Our young people in this country are learning a lot of really, really strange things in school. Uh, they are learning to promote collectivism and they are learning that individualism is greed and a nasty thing. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on uh, what's happening to our education system. Well, um, gosh, I don't know if I'm quite as aware as you think I am, but I, do, I can tell you this, that I was in the education system. I taught for several years. And I, um, while I was in a small school, I didn't see the Agenda 21 movement come in there at that point. But I did find out that um, I did back off from the things that they asked us to teach, and I ended up homeschooling my two youngest daughters um, because I just thought that the public schools were not teaching our history or our geography. And I think today they don't teach history. They don't. Um, they don't have an historical background and that's why they don't know about Congress and the Constitution. And I, be I have belonged for, for years for a couple organizations. Uh, one of them is uh, Cattle Women as well because of the beef um, industry and we try to go into the schools and counteract some of the teachings they get from the Humane Society and from the animal rights and from the Green Movement and the Sahara Club. And it's almost impossible to stay up with them. Like Matt, um, Mindy said, they have huge, huge budgets. And we're working against um, that kind of an agenda with volunteers and people who are ranching and farming full time who need to be out in the field in order to make a living. And so it just seems like it's almost an insurmountable uh, task to try to educate our children. But we, if, if everyone would be able to jump in and and be able to teach our children one-on-one -on -one, or when you have conversations in the... I know when I travel sometimes and I have conversations with the person next to me and I tell them I'm from a farm or ranch and they, first of all, don't believe it because they think we should all be wearing coveralls. But they're, they're very interested when, when they ask questions or you tell them something because they've only heard the other side of the story. And I don't think it's just the schools anymore with the Common Core. I think we've lost two or three generations that are away from real rural education. People who don't really understand that you need to shear sheep or that in order for children to learn about animals, they have to touch them and feel them and see them. And not all children can own a dog and dogs are not people. So um, the reality of our education to me is that it's just been bought up by, like I said um, earlier with my, with my analogy that um, they're getting um, green agenda, they're getting animal rights agenda, and they're not getting a true education. They're getting an ideology that is con directly contrary to the freedoms that we've been raised from with. Um, my grandparents were uh, Germans from Russia. They came out of a socialistic country, and I, my grandmother lived with me for years, and I was able to understand the horrors that they went through, the genocides and the government taking away their guns and then just making them into nothing but a poverty nation. And um, I don't want to go back to that. Um, and I see our road is heading that direction, and it makes me... You know, it makes me very sad to see that, and, and you've probably heard that it's the water inside of a boat that sinks it, and um, um, I don't want our country to go down. So I don't know if that answers your question about education, but it's just more than just a school. No, it, it, it does, Karen, and, and the thing is, Mindy, we've talked about it before as well, but... Um, 
Our, our kids have no understanding of where food comes from, uh, certainly the ones in the cities. Now, in rural Montana, yeah, for the most part, they know that uh, milk doesn't just appear in a grocery store in a carton. Uh, that you actually have to milk a cow. They understand that in Montana. But if you go to the major metropolitan areas in uh, many of these communities, these young people have no idea where food comes from. They just think it's going to be there. It's always going to be there because the government provides it. Uh, that's the way they think. And in reality, uh, if they shut down all the systems that they want to do, agriculture in the United States, the way it exists today, uh, will no longer exist. There'll be a few ultra large uh, corporate uh, uh, agriculture farming entities and the really, really big entities that uh, small farms will be a thing of the past. Um, you see that certainly, Mindy. Um, to tell our listeners uh, how you've watched the attacks on rural America, how many uh, people that were producers in our system, even since you've been uh, involved in it, how many of them have had to go out of business? Oh, it, it's stunning. Yeah, but you know, a lot of people don't realize when they showed up show up in the voting booth what they're voting for. All of these things are very deceptive. And the animal rights, the well-funded animal rights groups, you know, complete their their goal at, in each state and each local municipality. Um, well, oftentimes through uh, this legislative push through ballot initiatives. Uh, you know, we've seen these ballot campaigns really come hard after animal agriculture. Uh, we've seen it in California. We've seen it in Massachusetts. You know, pretending to be the savior of, of uh, egg-laying hens and, uh, you know, veal cows and, you know, pork producers and all these things. People who know nothing about raising, breeding, and working with animals are making the decision in the voting booth as to whether or not as, as consumers, they're making the decision on how these animals are raised. And as I said earlier, and you even uh, added to it as well, these are time-tested animal husbandry practices. And that means through time, farmers and ranchers have improved on things to become more efficient and do things better. And they've just been improving on things. And now these ballot initiatives unravel all of that because... The consumer, who knows nothing about how their food is being raised, all of a sudden have a say into how their food is being raised, and they think that it's it's a better it's better for the animals, better for the farmers, better for the consumers, and all of these things are completely flipped, uh, and it's this false narrative that they're buying into. Um, no different than the fake meat that we're now seeing out there, which I still can't believe somebody would, you know, you've got all these people who <laughs> worry so much about what's in their food, but they're going to, you know, have a Beyond Meat burger at Burger King this afternoon, you know, go figure. I, we are off the rails. And, you know, when I grew up in Southern California, I was not a farmer, I was not a rancher, I was very involved in the horse community, and but we cherish agriculture as Californians because we were surrounded by the bounty and my family celebrated agriculture every single day at every meal that was something that my mother um, and my dad too but I really uh, my I tip my hat to my mom on this because she never took anything for granted ever and that was just that was just exuded in her everyday life we cherished agriculture in 1950, half of our population in the United States were farmers and ranchers. Today, I am not certain what the percentage is, but I know it's below 1.5%. And so we have this small percentage of farmers and ranchers doing more with the resources that they have. It's a miracle, in my opinion, that they are able to feed as many people as we are today um, with with fewer resources and all the while, um, you know, being under the thumb of government regulations and uh, the scrutiny of the consumers and all these things, it, it really is, what worries me, um, and again, I'm not, I don't make my living farming and ranching, I'm really 
I've always been so heartfelt and grateful to those who do it because it means I don't have to. You know, I mean, I, I, I would if I had to, but I don't have to. And I think it's such a blessing in this country. I, I urge anyone who, who doesn't appreciate agriculture here in the United States to go visit another country <laughs> because, you know, mm -hmm. they're not as abundant, but we have this culture of abundance which has made things so readily available. We take so much for granted. And yet... Absolutely. Uh, man, Andy, Andy I uh, hate to break uh, in the middle of the conversation, but uh, uh, pick that up on the other side of the break, and uh, we'll go to our commercial break. Serving the planet, the micro-effect. www.themicroeffect.com You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl, conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free, it was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid the child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the people and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And my guests today are Mindy Patterson and Karen Yost, and we're talking about the animal rights movement in the United States and how it is impacting private property all over our nation and eventually it will all over the world. So uh, with that, but before we get back into the uh, uh I really want to talk about a new sponsor that we have program. It's called 7K Metals. And um, I, I'm going to do a, a real quick uh, uh, little advertisement for them because we haven't gotten the, uh, the full advertisement put together yet. But uh, they are helping us to really expand our programming and they are going to be a huge uh, sponsor, a huge help future. Uh, and I will start the ad now. Are you prepared for the upcoming economic collapse and currency reset? Right now the stock market is sitting at historic highs, but how much longer can this last? The 2008 banking crisis nearly brought down the whole world financial system and only managed to kick the can down the road a few years by saddling the American taxpayers with trillions in additional debt. That was 11 years ago, and national and personal debt levels are much worse today, pushing us to the point where the dollar is nearly worthless. Gold and silver have been true money for thousands of years and may be the only asset class left standing when the inevitable global financial collapse happens. You buy insurance for your car, home, and life to prepare for life's mishaps. Why not purchase some insurance for the inevitable world financial meltdown, especially if that insurance is better than money in the bank and available at wholesale prices? Support 
connecting the dots and ensure your financial survival by joining me at www.danhappel.com and click on the 7K Metals icon to learn more about a program that would be the best financial insurance policy in America. Uh, this group is uh, much like Costco. They are a, a membership uh, wholesale um, Precious Metals Group, and I'm really, really happy to have them on board with us, and uh, I look forward to working with them, and if you want to support Connecting the Dots and, and this radio program, there's no better way, because you can increase your personal wealth, and you can increase that little insurance policy that may be the difference between your financial future being bright and your financial future being very, very uh, dismal. So uh, with that, okay, Mindy, I'm sorry I had to um, break in on you there, but uh, go ahead and finish your thought, please. Not at all. Oh, I was just talking about the deceptive ballot initiative campaigns where the animal rights groups, primarily the Humane Society of the United States, basically buys votes, in my opinion, by uh, using the ballot initiative or the ballot box uh, which by the way is a is not in every state um, you know it's, it's uh, in about 24 states in the US and unfortunately California was one of the first states to fall prey to this and it has really harmed animal agriculture because they came in and in 2008 had Proposition 2, which was called the Prevention of Farm Animal Cruelty Prevention Act, um, you know, that passed at 63% of the vote. HSUS spent $10.5 million to get their yes vote, and it basically created a situation where it mandated larger, uh, larger cages and corrals for animals, okay? So 10 years later, in 2018, 18... It, you know, uh, 2018, HSUS came back with another ballot initiative, uh, pretty much the same ballot initiative in the state of California, overseeing egg producers and veal producers and pork producers, except it was no longer about bigger cages, it's about empty cages. And now they have forced all these farmers to no longer have the ability to confine the animals that they're raising for food. Well, as I said earlier, and you pointed out as well, time-tested animal husbandry has given us this wonderful uh, these tools and knowledge to do things and work smarter, not harder. And certainly, uh, these things have not only been better for humans, but better for the animals, making them more comfortable, more content, easily uh, easier to feed them, keeping the dust down. I mean, this is what innovation has provided for agriculture. But again, because it's really not about the animals for the animal rights group, they have wanted to eliminate all of these confinement uh, uh, implementations that have been uh, built up through the years and really increase this, uh, the efficiency, that's the word I was looking for, the efficiency of animal agriculture. Well, that's now gone down the tubes with the passing of, of first it was Proposition 2 and then 10 years later it was Proposition 12 which passed about, again, with about 50% of the vote in the state of California, now mandating cage-free everything. Well, no farmer is going to be able to, you know, make a decent living by uh, having everything cage-free. And that's just a fact. And it's made it very, very difficult. So a lot of farmers in the state of California have either moved or gone out of business. So essentially, what does that do? It decreases uh, the availability, uh, it basically raises the cost because it reduces the total production of these foods and livestock, therefore weakening the economic structure. So my point here is, are we going to be reliant on foreign countries for our food supply is eventually? Because all these, this push by the animal rights groups have pushed all our farmers out of business and therefore we'll, we'll be reliant on foreign countries for our food supply just like we did with energy and that didn't work out so well for us. I'm very concerned about the end game being us reliant on foreign countries like China, uh, like Mexico, so on and so forth for uh, solely reliant on foreign countries for our food. 
that is not going to, to bode well, um, you know, for for anyone. And so we need to cherish our farmers and ranchers. We need to um, quit giving in and bending to the will of the animal rights ideology and quit. Where did our discernment go as a nation? You know, Karen talked a minute ago about uh, what's happening in the classroom and the fact that, that our schools have completely extracted any knowledge about civics and the Constitution and cherishing and appreciating our form of government. Well, that goes for agriculture. You know, when I was a kid, we used to go visit the egg farm and the dairy and learn where our food comes from. But we don't do that anymore. I, 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 you know, obviously they have eliminated the budget for those things, but these are the things that are important. Instead, we're just filling air and space with these kids and not really giving them a valuable education on what things that matter. And, you know, you reap what you sow. I don't, I, you know, really it boils down to that. And I am terribly concerned about the future of our country, um, mainly because we are not cherishing our farmers and ranchers today. No, you're absolutely right with that. And um, uh, I have to say, you know, you look at all the medical uh, all the improvements in health for humans as well as animals and a lot of the things that they're battling to get rid of uh, like you know like medical experimentation uh, to improve to create uh, viable anti-cancer drugs and things like that improve lives all over the world we are a leader in that and yet they're trying to put that completely out of business Agriculture is a daily miracle, in my opinion, and that comes from someone who has always appreciated it, but I've never, I, I've never been a farmer or rancher, but I have always been drawn to agriculture through my love of horses and the horse industry. It is, a, it is amazing the innovation that agriculture has provided in the medical world and biomedical, and not only for humans, but for animals as well. And one of the things that I have to add, you know, in this legislative push that I've been talking about, one of the things that uh, we've recently developed is a, uh, a booklet educating legislators and the public about the importance of true conservation and private ownership to save species. And I say that because when we go and testify uh, against animal rights driven legislation that wants to chip away at a lot of the uh, ability for people to own zoos and educational zoos and exhibiting animals at the fair and all of these things that we take for granted that someday you'll go to the fair and it just won't, there will be no animals there. People need to understand, you know, their, their knee-jerk reaction, even a, a legislators have said this to me, well, these animals belong in the wild. Well, the sad reality of that is there really is no wild anymore. Um, yes, there are conservation efforts happening in the, in the native uh, land for some of these species, but the realities of the wild are not pretty. There's habitat loss, there's poaching, there's illness, there's predators, there's starvation, lack of proper nutrition, there's drought, horrible drought. Um, in foreign countries, Dan, when you mentioned um, earlier about how a lot of these countries that are guilty of polluting in the United States, it is not, it is not happening on our watch. We're not the guilty culprits here. That goes for all the plastic and garbage and human pollution that has resulted in an abundance of trash littering um, in, in foreign countries. These animals are, are eating plastic because there's nothing else to eat, so they go through dumps. Elephants uh, in Asia and other places. So my point here is is that, you know, animals that are uh, not native species to the United States that we have in, our, in human care, we are really lucky to have them uh, in the hands of the experts that will advance their breeding and the benefits of human care so that we can learn more about these animals today and for future gener generations. But, you know, we've got this ideology that is so knee-jerk and uninformed that is pushing all this, these legislative efforts to take animals out of the experts' hands. And, and that is really what is happening, and it's, and it's happening at lightning speed. I'm really concerned about 
someday my grandchildren uh, never being able to see an elephant in person or um, a live tiger or seeing some of these animals up close and personal and learning about them firsthand instead of just from a Google search or a hologram that they're now doing in the circuses. They're, they're just doing holograms of animals. I'm sorry, there, that just does not, that doesn't cut the muster. And, and it's all because of the animal rights groups that this is happening. Conservation uh, includes, and this, this includes hunting as well, by the way, as you well know, but conservation incorporates breeding. Uh, the breeding of animals and you know a lot of these zoos and private owners of exotic animals are doing uh, yeoman's work in advancing technology and the education and understanding of these species so that we can have them you know for us to uh, care about for future generations but that'll all go away at the hand of the animal rights movement um, with these legislative efforts that are happening at the local, state, and federal level. It just chips away incrementally. And that then the same goes for um, for agriculture. So mm -hmm. well and I'm glad you mentioned the the plastic uh, thing. I uh, also at the same time I got that information on the five hundred dirtiest cities, which uh, the United States does not have one. Um, I also got some information on this this gigantic uh, plastic uh, waste dump out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that uh, turns out that uh, the countries who are creating that gigantic plastic waste dump are all from Asia. Uh, the United States is a very, very small percentage of the plastic that uh, goes into that, and that 80% of it is commercial fishing gear from places like Japan and China that ends up uh, being lost at sea and washed over into this area. But the bottom line is they don't care uh, exactly what makes that up. It just makes good propaganda to try to shut down the United States of America. And if you look at all the things that they're doing, it's targeted against our industries, it's targeted against our agriculture, it's targeted against our uh, ability to make free choices. All this stuff is a direct affront to our way of life as a free constitutional republic. And that's what this whole thing is all about. Exactly. It's very, it's very deceptive. So, and, but and the animal rights groups bank on the American public remaining completely unaware of what is truly behind their emotionally charged uh, list of propaganda, which is often nothing more than a fundraising tactic for their a radical agenda to destroy legal businesses and our American way of life. You know, you talked about, uh, or Karen talked about, uh, the fact that HSUS never shows up to do anything. You know, the polar vortex, <laughs> what they named the polar vortex, the snowstorm that happened. It was very, very serious. I'm not laughing because it, it's just the fact that they named it is why I was laughing. But it was a very serious blizzard that took place about a month ago. But funny, where was HSUS and PETA? They were nowhere to be found. We had dire circumstances and what was beautiful was that farmers and ranchers rallied and took time off out of their own life to help fellow paddlemen and ranchers it was awesome and you know shipping hay to these uh, farmers and ranchers to feed their livestock that is who we are as Americans that is who we are HSUS was nowhere to be found and unless it's a, fund, an, a fundraising opportunity for them, they never show up. They only show up when it, it becomes an effort for them to raise money. And that is really sad. And a lot of people don't understand that. They don't, they open up their checkbook and spend that 1995 a month on an organization that does nothing but raise money to further their agenda. You know, when I show up at the capitals across the U.S. And, and testify in opposition to their bills and their legislation, they have a minimum of two lobbyists in every state house that are working daily to push their agenda. They have lobbyists 
They have lawyers on, you know, retainer. They also have pro bono lawyers all across the country. If people want to know where their money goes, it doesn't go to save pets, that's for sure. It goes to fund and fuel an animal rights ideology that is basically working daily, 24-7, around the clock, to take away your right to own a dog and, you know, eliminate the, the food on your plate. That is what they're really, truly all about. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, Karen, I, I want to get you back into this because uh, we've seen that happening in Montana. Uh, the animal rights movement, even though um, you wouldn't think a, a rural state like Montana would have so well organized in so many groups, that there are 500 environmental groups that have offices or personnel in both. Montana of all places and um, we, we've, uh, we're seeing more and more of this and one of the reasons that they target rural states like Montana is because we don't have a huge population. We have a very, very small population and we've got a lot of ground and they're trying to do everything in their power to eliminate the people and turn Montana back in the wilderness. Uh, you worked with Teresa Manzella. You've worked with uh, legislators on some of these issues. I'd love to hear uh, your, your perception of uh, some of the groups that are uh, present in Helena that are trying so hard to try to turn Montana back into a wilderness. Well, Dan, I think you've really hit it on the head that um, the reason the environmental groups are in Montana is because our population is so small and it's easy to get things passed. But I think it's also exactly the reason why they're attacking agriculture. Um, with, with less than 2% of our population uh, belonging to agriculture, it's easy for them to target our property rights. It's easy for them to talk, target our animal rights. And it's easy to um, target the agriculture people because there are so few of us. But ultimately, what they target in agriculture is going to reach out to the rest of the population. I know you understand that the um, danger it is to all of our rights as citizens once they eliminate animal agriculture, once they eliminate the right to own animals. I was, um, when I testified this year at um, Helena for Mindy's Working Animal Protection Act, there were, um, uh, fortunately in the House, there were about seven people who were uh, supporting that bill, but there were also like three animal rights groups um, uh, opposing the bill, and it was very obvious they knew each other and they knew who they were, and and so did um, all of the committee members know them. So while I'm not really familiar with all of them, I think actually you're I think because of the wide open spaces and the animal prairie reserve and the beautiful um, country that we have. They're targeting Montana not only because we have a small population, but they think that it should be a national park, that uh, the buffalo should roam freely and there should be no reason for cattle to be here. Um, Bruce Vincent once said that um, when he goes to New York to speak and the, the people there have only seen stores and pavement and big buildings and they'll make a visit out to the west or come to Montana and they see the mountains and they see the rivers and they see the pristine beauty of it, they're easily sucked into environmental um, um, movements because it's like, oh yes, we wanted to stay like that. They have no idea that people actually live here and make a living and that the reason it's so beautiful is because it's an agricultural state and farmers and ranchers take care of their property. And so, um, Yes, there are many environmental groups in Montana, and I think it's just indicative of um, the beauty that we have here, and it's probably the first line of defense. Unfortunately, I see Montana going, um, bowing to their ways in, in so many times that um, there's so much pressure from the environmental groups to, our, like Mindy said, in our legislators and in our making our laws that they're they're making a difference in Montana that's not necessarily for the good of Montanans, but just a, making it a national preservation area. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been in touch a little bit with, um, I want to 
diverse a little bit too about the animal rights and the attack on animal. You know, my husband and uh, my family, uh, we own Nutrilix. It's a liquid feed supplement company for cattle. So we um, sell a feed for um, range cows and calves. <coughs> out, of, out in the range, we provide important vitamins and minerals for them. And so beef has not, beef has been a huge, what, what I see happening is that when the animal rights movement doesn't work, then they're relying back on, well, this is a great environment and cattle are ruining our land. So the environmental focus now is almost as widely spread and as important or as threatening to our agriculture community as is the uh, animal rights groups. Um, the greenhouse gas issue, the World Health Organization stated years ago, erroneously I might add, that 18% of greenhouse gases uh, come from cattle. And since then they've rescinded that. Less than 9% um, comes from all agriculture and less than 3% come from cattle, but no one is using that um, greenhouse gas number. And so what they're finding out is that they're teaching children the um, the green agenda in our schools, like almost every book you pick up, I just picked one up um, a couple of weeks ago at a at a discount store because I was giving a presentation on agriculture, and it's like the things you can do to help our environment, and of course, always listed is there is don't eat meat. Cattle are detrimental to our um, environment. When in fact, there's been again scientific studies that show that grazing of cattle, number one, is, is an asset to our pastures, and number two, that the um, cattle only graze where, uh, where where you can't farm crops. And they say we need to do cultivating, and the cattle are eating all of the um, profits or they're on the land that we should be growing crops on. Well, cattle cattle are food, and so. Just to back off a little bit, uh, one of the huge issues in Montana I see are environmental groups accusing agriculture of emitting greenhouse gases and causing um, a, a damages to our environment when in effect it's the, it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I uh, I have um, um, actually a friend who is uh, with one of these environmental groups that's uh, promoting some of this stuff, but we laughed about it because he showed me a picture and he said, okay, well, one side of this has got cattle grazing on it, the other side has buffalo on it. Which side is which? Well, uh, when he takes that to... Uh, uh, you know, a group of, of uh, kids or whatever, they always pick the damage side as being the, the cattle side. But the fact is, is buffalo are much harder on the land than cattle are. Cattle are very, very easy feeders compared to buffalo. And uh, that's kind of the whole the whole story of, of the whole movement because in fact 90 percent of greenhouse gas is actually water vapor and it has nothing to do with uh, CO2 that has nothing to do with methane or anything else and the amount of greenhouse gas can be tied to anything in agriculture is minuscule. It's, it's a, a percentage of 1% that can actually be tied as detrimental to the environment. And CO2, in fact, is a gas of life, and we ought to be applauding the fact that the uh, CO2 is going up. But I hate to tell the environmentalists this, but the fact is, is uh, most of the CO2 is coming from the oceans, not from agriculture. And you know where else it's coming from? It's coming from wetlands, which our government is is setting aside and taking out away property, private, privately managed property, and set it aside for wetlands. And it's a huge emitter of greenhouse gases. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, um, you know what it boils down to, and it always gets back to the same thing. And Montana is a certainly a, a, a case in point. I, I used to be a county commissioner over in Madison County, um, and when we were when I was dealing with other county commissioners. 
uh, we talked about all the issues that uh, were affecting private property rights and uh, MACO, the Montana Association of Counties, and NACO, the National Association of Counties, has become a huge promoter of socialism because they get government grants and they get all these federal programs and they've forgotten that what a, a county commissioner's role is is to protect the private property and the citizens and the tax base within the county. And uh, they've turned really county commissioners into hogs at the trough, uh, trying to uh, pick up as many government programs as they can so that they can bring home the bacon to their uh, to their <laughs> constituents at the county level. That's not right, is it? Wow, I did not know that about Mako, but I do know that I would be follow the money. Uh, one of the things I think that maybe your listeners might want to do if they're at all interested in some of these issues and finding out more of the truth is to go into the organizations that support these go into the website and find out not only who their board members are, but where they've come from and where their money comes from. And I think you'll be surprised, or they think they would be surprised to find out that um, the environmental groups are all affiliated, uh, that the people have all come from the, from the same agenda um, focus. Um, very interesting to me when I was um, studying a little bit about the uh, uh, climate change. Uh, yeah, here, and I, here, I need to interrupt, but uh, can you uh, hold that thought and we'll pick it up on the other side of the break? Sure, sure. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And today, my guests on the radio show are Mindy Patterson and Karen Yost. And uh, Karen, you had some thoughts about uh, following the money. Uh, and, and boy, they're uh, poignant facts because uh, certainly the American Prairie Reserve is a case in point. Uh, the Weiss Foundation and West Germans, and well, now it's Germany, um, is where the money is coming from that's putting an awful lot of the uh, uh, the funding behind this American Prairie Reserve. And incidentally, that group is actually headquartered in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, they're one of the uh, uh, premier groups. They talk about the American Serengeti, and they believe that literally the whole eastern half of Montana, as well as uh, the Dakotas, and Nebraska, Wyoming, clear down uh, into Nebraska should be the new American Serengeti, and that's what they refer to it as. So, yes, follow the money and learn more about these groups, and I think most average Americans would be appalled if they knew where all this money was coming from. Exactly. And, you know, I first heard about what you're referring to now as the Rocky Mountain Corridor uh, through American Agriwomen. And, and um, it was like they want a prairie reserve all the way from Canada through Montana, and it's eventually going to be even larger than just Montana. But it's been around for a long time. I just found an article not too long ago in some of my dad's papers from 1986 when they were calling it the Buffalo Commons. And so now it's come to the American Prairie Reserve, and it's backed, like you said, by foreign money. And the danger in this is um, the money is big. Um, they're buying out ranches. They're asking for our federal and state governments to give them exemptions on their grazing that cattlemen are not allowed to. So it's not even an equal competition. So um, heads up on the American Prairie Reserve. It's a, it's a it's, um, yeah, it's an it's it's a danger in my eyes. Uh, the other thing is, it all goes back to climate change and that um, the, the, the idea that agriculture damages the environment. And so the environmental footprint of agriculture has been highly um, vilified, as you probably know. When I first started to study a little bit about the United Nations and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it was established in 1988. And it was to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments on the current state of knowledge about climate change. 
But when I actually researched the members of that climate uh, a committee several years ago, and that was during the time that they made their initial uh, recommendations and projections on um, eliminating greenhouse gases and who was the largest cause of them, I found that the original members None of them had a doctorate or a master's in climatology, and all of them had resumes of previous work in environmental causes. And I think if you study a little bit more about that panel and the United Nations, and you see that, I think it goes back to, um, Dan, what you mentioned on a, what was used to be Agenda 21, and is it now Agenda 2030, to destroy America, actually, to destroy our rights, and to make everything into um, to equalize, to equalize the world. And in order to equalize the social structure of the world, America has to go down because you know that the other societies are all below us as far as economic advantages and the privileges and the, all of the advances that we have made. So um, it's important to not take um, something at face value unless you really explore it and you, and like you said, follow the money and find out who's paying for it and who is who is behind what is um, um, making these policies. Yeah, it, um, if you follow the money, you always end up in the same place. And I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the uh, IPCC and the UN and Agenda 21, 2030. Uh, the Brundtland Commission was really the the group that was formed in 1987-88 uh, uh, that started the whole Agenda 21 process. And the the uh, chairman of that group was Gru Harlan Brotlin, who happened to be uh, a Norwegian socialist. And uh, she was uh, at one time the head of the International Socialist Party. And that's exactly the people who are in charge of all these different commissions for the UN are the people that are promoting communism and socialism and that's why it's so important that they bring down the United States of America the last constitutional republic that believes in freedom and individual liberties and private property and that that's why we've been targeted so aggressively um, I have to tell you we've got a, uh, a program coming up with uh, Jim Carlson uh, we haven't set the date for it yet but uh, there there are a number of county commissioners in the uh, center of Montana and the eastern counties that are working aggressively to expose the American Prairie Reserve uh, for what it is. And they're going to be doing a, uh, uh, a meeting in, I believe, in early May in Lewistown, Montana. And uh, they're going to be tackling a lot of these issues. And I, all I can say is that uh, it's about time because eastern Montana is being swallowed up by all these aggressive environmental groups that are buying uh, either conservation easements or outright uh, theft of, of private land out there through uh, various means uh, that, that uh, take away the rights to graze cattle, and that's what it's all targeted on. So um, uh, I guess, Mindy, I need to get you back into the conversation. Sure. Karen was just going to add something to that, I think. Okay, Is that yeah. you know, property owners of Montana, I can, Dan? That, um, the a group that's working to expose the American Prairie Reserve? Is that who we're, who Jim Carlson is with? Yeah, and, and Jim Carlson is uh, uh, one of the, uh, and I, I don't want to get into too much detail until we, uh, until he has this meeting. But he is actually uh, with a group out of uh, Kansas, and they look at what is behind the government uh, regulations to make sure that they follow their own regulations before they take private property and uh, turn it into public lands, or also that they. Uh, follow the regulations that the government has laid out for them uh, when it comes to dealing with all these outside groups, these NGOs, these uh, non-governmental organizations that now 
seemed to be the uh, tail wagging the dog. And um, uh, if off air, I'll uh, I'll kind of fill you in on some of the things that Jim is working on, Karen, and then uh, watch for a radio program within the next month and a half because we're gonna we're gonna have a full expose of this. R Ross Butcher, uh, a uh, county commissioner out of uh, Fergus County, uh, Lewis County area, is kind of having the charge on this, uh, and there's quite a, a group of people that are finding starting to understand that Agenda 21 is alive and well in Montana. True. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that information. Okay. Uh, Mindy, you've, you've been uh, uh, quiet through this uh, last 15 minutes or so. I do want to get you back into the discussion because I know how important it is to you that people are aware of the groups that are behind all these movements. And I, I put in my announcement a picture of a paw with a clenched fist next to it. Uh, this is one of the new symbols of the uh, the uh, environmental movement. Uh, I find that particularly poignant, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And since you were discussing in depth some of the Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, I just want to add, since, you know, the topic, the main topic was animal rights issues today. Let's not forget, too, he's deceased now, but let's not forget that Maurice Strong, the founder of Sustainable Development and Agenda 21, uh, sat on the board of directors of the Humane Society of the United States for many, many years. And, you know, if you put some of the uh, laws and regulatory reforms that have been put into place uh, over the last 10, 15 years on uh, licensed animal and pet breeders uh, and animal agriculture into the perspective of Agenda 21, one begins to see the alarming trend and uh, connecting the dots uh, into the limitation of the number of animals you can own, uh, things like mandatory spay neuter, unfettered access to the outdoors, temperature control, guardianship laws for pets, uh, limitation of, of all kinds of of uh, onerous, onerous regulations that only intend is to put people out of business that really have little to do with the welfare of animals. And um, while Agenda 21 should be a bipartisan concern, I am always blown away at the number of congressional members and state legislators and even county commissioners and city council members who are completely naive and unaware of Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 and the fact that what they're implementing uh, through, uh, whether it's, um, you know, development standards uh, from economic development and the planning and planning commission on home development or whether it's overseeing, uh, you know, animal feeding operations for agriculture, these people do not have a clue as to what it is they're actually implementing and what they're implementing is destroying uh, America and our infrastructure uh, for agriculture and so forth. So I just wanted to add that one little piece about Agenda 21 and the ties back to the animal rights ideology uh, and, and cult, if you will, all came from Maurice Strong. I mean, this is all a plan. This did not happen by accident. This was, you know, planned, premeditated. And UN, UN Agenda 21 always comes cloaked in a disguise behind, as Karen mentioned, the climate change and green movement and environmentalism is seeking to promote this false narrative of sustainability, which is publicized as, you know, conserving an ecological balance, but forgetting the fact that farmers and ranchers have been sustainable by definition for, for centuries. And um, while all of their plans sound so benign and touchy-feely and great, uh, when you really pull back the curtain, Agenda 21 is eating away at American sovereignty little bit by bit, like a cancer, and ultimately destroying our right to private property and moving us toward, as Dan said earlier, global governance, governance and a totalitarian state. 
those are their goals. And if Americans don't wake up, you know, all these things will slip away. It, it's all happening. It, you know what's difficult for me is once your eyes have been opened to what the UN Agenda 21 is and the false narrative of the sustainable development and global governance and taking the rights away from the individual, pushing this collectivism. Once you see these things, you can't unsee it. And I see it in everything. I see it everywhere, from the grocery store to going to the feed store to, um, you know, one of the things that we haven't touched on that falls under the umbrella of um, Agenda 21 is this, what they call the precautionary principle. You know, we have to save you. Government has to save you before something actually happens, you know. We, we want to implement policies that, it, it, that save you from something that might happen. And that is, that's also at play here with these regulatory reforms. And it's insane. It really is. You know, so much for self-reliance. You know, we, people keep passing policies that give government and government bureaucracies more power because they think that we are incapable of taking care of our businesses and our land. And um, it, it's, that's all part of it, too. Yeah, you're spot on with that, Mindy. Um, I'd, I'd like to use the last uh, ten or uh, ten or so minutes talking about two things: uh, how we can expose the environmental movements. Maybe even if you've got some uh, some groups and some names that you want to mention on air, and then how important it is for our listeners to get off their butt and get involved. Uh, we cannot do this with a handful of people. We need uh, average American to wake up to the reality of what we're facing here and get involved. Uh, we'll, let's start with uh, Karen with you on that and then we'll finish with Mindy. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I am a member of Montana AgriWomen and uh, our goal is to uh, provide a, uh, promote a positive perception of agriculture. If um, you have listeners out there who are interested in joining with us, uh, we would love it because these are the kind of issues that we talk about and that we um, write to our legislators about and um, contact um, uh, schools and regulators about. Uh, it, with um, our organization and Montana AgriWomen, we're also um, an affiliate of American AgriWomen. We um, post our positions on our website at AmericanAgWomen.org. We had a mid-year meeting just recently in Las Vegas where we wrote our 2019 positions and we're going to head to Washington, D.C. on June the 9th through the 12th, where at this point we have um, uh, meetings and interviews with both the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Interior because as we talk about, those, those uh, bureaus have huge uh, impact on whether we can survive or not. And in Montana AgriWomen, we've got things going on as well. Um, might be interesting for the people in Montana to know that on June the 25th, we have a public information forum. It'll be at Rocky Mountain College at Los Comp, um Hall, and Mindy Patterson will be our featured speaker there. So we're excited about that. It'll be in the evening. There'll be like a social hour and then a chance for Mindy to speak and time for questions and answers there. So. And then one more thing, Dan, that if you don't mind me plugging this in, 2020, um, the National Convention for American AgriWomen will be held in Bozeman, Montana, kind of your own, own stomping grounds. Uh, Montana AgriWomen is hosting that, and we're working on that for November the 4th through the 6th in 2020. So we're looking forward to um, going to your fair city up there. Well, you know, that's uh, that's really the belly of the beast. I'm really tickled uh, to hear that you're going to hold it there because it's going to be very, very important. Uh, the next year, year and a half is going to be literally the battleground. And we need to uh, we need to make sure that people wake up to what's happening in this country. Uh, Mindy, I, I want to give you a chance. We're going to be running out of time here shortly. Uh, sure. I want to give you a chance to talk about uh, how we can expose these groups, how people can be part of the solution rather than the problem, and uh, more about the uh, cavalry group. 
Well, the Cavalry Group was formed to protect the little guy. We are a member-based company uh, protecting and defending the constitutional rights uh, of law-abiding animal enterprises, animal owners, and, uh, you know, citizens across the United States who basically just uh, want to know that there is an organization working legally, legislatively, and culturally to uh, protect our uh, right to private property. And, uh, and so that's really the heart of, of what we're doing. We just celebrated our eighth year of being in business. Uh, we have members in the 48 continental states. As far as the solution goes, you know, um, I tell people all the time, you know, you don't like the way things are going, run for office. Even if it's uh, for the local school board, um, the city council, county commissioner, uh, run for office. Also, write articles, write op-eds, educate people. Things, we have to inform people. There's so much. There's this drinking from the fire hose constantly of information coming at us. Uh, through television and radio that's a completely false information. So talk to people, talk to your kids, talk to your family. Um, just, you know, pay attention to what your local schools are teaching. Um, get involved with that especially. Support the Constitution. Support constitutional principles. Hold a Constitution educational class in your living room. You know, um, there's all sorts of opportunities. Hillsdale College runs a free course on Constitution 101. Learn and understand the Constitution and, and make it a point to uh, share those principles with friends, family, and neighbors. Support organizations that support, support the Constitution and our right to private property, such as the Cavalry Group. We have, like I said, we are a member-based company. We cannot do what we do without members. And so we have, um, you know, a membership that ranges from starting at $75 annually. Um, we, we show up to the microphone because we have the ability to do so because we are members supported. Our members fuel us to be able to get us to fight all of these things. And we also have attorneys on retainer to provide that extra support for our members in case they are uh, being defended upon by unwarranted uh, search and seizure, which is another aspect we didn't get to, but that is happening across the country. Um, join and support American Agro Women. I am very honored to have been a part of this organization for quite a few years now, and I'll tell you, they are an amazing group of women across the United States made up of uh, people who are actually involved in agriculture in one aspect or another, and they take it very seriously. Uh, they study policy, they get actively involved in policy making um, everywhere and it's just a phenomenal group and I feel so honored to be a part of them. Um, and so support organizations that support our American way of life and make sure that we, you know, support those organizations going forward. Uh, you know, if you can't afford the time to to do, the, to do some of these things yourself and support these organizations. And you can find the Cavalry Group online. Make sure you spell it like the military infantry and not the church. A lot of people misspell it. <laughs> so it's C-A-V-A-L-R-Y, cavalrygroup.com. We are, uh, you know, we have a, a pretty extensive website, including all the policy and, and law legislative stuff we're working on to some of the legal cases that we've taken on. Uh, from our blog and news feed and there's just so much going on it's, it's insane but I will close with this Ronald Reagan quote because I want everybody to understand that it's important that everybody make an effort in some way shape or form but oftentimes people are afraid and Ronald Reagan said it best when he said if some among you fear taking a stand because you are afraid of reprisal from customers, clients or even government recognize you are just eating the crocodile hoping he will eat you last there's so much at stake with our American way of life and our fundamental principles that if, if we don't take a stand to protect them, we will, unfortunately, in our lifetime, I'm afraid, see them fall away. So we're at a very critical crossroads for our country. And, Dan, you are awesome to have this show. Thank you for having me and, and uh, on your show again. And this has just been a terrific opportunity. Thank you for all you do.
Well, uh, thank you guys. And uh, Karen, I'm, I'm pleased to make your introduction over the radio. And uh, when uh, Mindy, when you come to uh, Montana this summer, I uh, please let me know uh, the exact date. I will try to be there because uh, you're a great personal friend and I've got an, an enormous amount of respect for what you're doing to try to save this nation. We need more people like you ladies that are part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Thank you for being our guest today. As the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. And the fact is, is that uh, everything that we see is connected together. Agenda 21, Marxism, world government, uh, the, the animal rights movement, the uh, uh, introduction of uh, invasive, I, I call them invasive species, uh, but the fact is, is like the gray wolves, the Canadian gray wolves, things like that. This is all part of the same plan, and it's a plan to destroy America as we know it and move us into a one world communist socialist technocratic government and folks it's time for us to stand up and do the right thing so uh, with that uh, thank you and uh, please join us again next week for connecting the dots with Dan Happel and uh, Mindy thank you again and Karen thank you again thank you you're so welcome